Hi, I'm Jandra Mueller, and I'm the Clinic Director for the Public Health and Rehabilitation Center in Encinitas, California. And I'm also the one who's providing the nutritional services that we just started offering here at PHRC. Um, so May is Public Pain Awareness Month, and in honor of Public Pain Awareness Month, I will be reviewing a common female pelvic pain disorder, vulvodynia. So I think it's important before getting into vulvodynia, we understand what the vulva is and what it is not. So the vulva is not the vagina. Most women, when we refer to our parts, we often will just say, oh, my vagina hurts, my vagina, my vagina. And it's actually, most of the time, we are referring to the vulva. So the vulva is the external genitalia and tissue that basically protects our sexual organs, um, our, the opening to our urethra, and the opening to the vagina, which is the introitus. So I'm going to take my cursor along. So I'm going to demonstrate, um, I'm going to walk through the anatomy so we all understand what we're looking at. So this is um, looking from a woman kind of in the position that you go to the gynecologist, which is called the lithotomy position. So I'm looking straight at the vulva. This is the mons pubis, which is the front part um, where the pubic carries and pubic bone is. And then you have the anus down here. Here's the, the gluteal fold. Um, and then coming up through here from top to bottom, here's the clitoris, this little dot here. And then this is called the hood of the clitoris. This comes over top of the clitoris to protect it. Down here, you then have the labia minora, the smaller lips, and then the labia majora. This is where you'll have more of the pubic hair. Inside here, you have the urethral meatus, which is the opening to the urethra. And then you have the introitus. This is where you'll also see the hymen. This is the entrance to the vagina. And then you have the anus here. This tissue through here, which is inside the inner labia or labia minora is called your vestibule. It's the tissue that surrounds um, the introitus and the urethral meatus. So let's give a little history about what, where, how far vulvodynia has come in, in terminology and in practice. So vulvodynia used to be termed a chronic pain of unknown origin in the vulva persisting at least for three months essentially without an, a known cause, a treatment, or a cure. So the first, um, first time that pelvic pain was really, or vul vulvar pain was really talked about was, or seen in the literature, was in 2003. Um, the International Society of the Study of Vulval Vaginal Disease, ISSVD, had this classification. They had vulvar pain that is related to a specific disorder. So infectious, inflammatory, neoplastic, neurologic, and then there was vulvodynia, which is a pretty general term. And all it has here are basically descriptive characteristics about the vulvodynia. It's provoked or unprovoked, um, and where is it located? So to give a little history and background on this, um, back in about maybe the late 90s, early 2000s, pelvic health was really focused among the postpartum population, so treating, you know, perineal tears and prolapse and incontinence issues, but there wasn't, the pelvic pain side was really just coming about. Um, so the professionals in the field treating pelvic pain knew that this, this was not the case. It was not this unknown, untreatable disorder. And so what ended up happening was um, a task force actually came together and we'll talk about that in a, in a minute, um, actually. So the task force came together um, between a bunch of healthcare professionals that were involved in vulvar care and female sexual health. Um, so ISSVD, ISHWISH, which is the International Society of the Study of Women's Sexual Health, and the IPPS, which is the International Pelvic Pain Society, they invited um, a bunch of healthcare professionals, and among them, actually, one of our co-founders, Stephanie Prendergast, helped with this. They knew that this was not the case, but among these experts, they wanted to create some sort of terminology that then could be actually passed on to the general provider, so that there was understanding that this is not just a, 
a disease that has no cure or treatment. And there was actually evidence to say how it can originate and how you can treat it. So these individuals came together over three days and it was initiated by Dr. Goldstein, um, Dr. Andrew Goldstein and Dr. Erwin Goldstein. And the, you know, the end result was that they wanted to, all three of these societies were to come together on some nomenclature based on all the research that was out there for vulvodynia, um, how it occurs and how to treat it. And then they were gonna come up with some standardized terms that then all providers, not just the experts have so that we can better understand and treat this disease. So here's what they come up, came up with. So vulvodynia is now considered, um, it, is a, it is vulvar pain, and it can be con uh, caused by a specific disorder, have associated factors, or there can be an unidentified cause, but there can be associated things with it that are treatable. So they've expanded now this list um, where it used to say just a few of those. So vulvar pain now can be infectious, inflammatory, neoplastic, neurologic, trauma, iatrogenic, hormonal. And then vulvodynia still is, you know, vulvar pain of at least three months. That's not due to one of these, but are have, you can still describe, and there's some associated factors with that. So the associated factors can be um, comorbidities or other pain syndromes. So painful bladder syndrome or interstitial cystitis, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, TMJ, uh, there can be genetic components to this. Um, there can be hormonal factors, inflammation, musculoskeletal issues like pelvic floor dysfunction, pelvic muscle overactivity, which is high tone pelvic floor, too, too tight, um, biomechanical issues, neurologic mechanisms, either from the central nervous system, so spine or brain, uh, brain spinal cord or brain, and then peripheral, which um, we'll get into those in a little bit and psychological factors, psychosocial factors, and structural defects can cause this. So going back a slide. So once we know it's not one of these issues, we can confidently say, you know, you do have pain somewhere in the vulva. Sometimes it's specific or localized. This would be fall into the descriptor terms. It can be provoked or unprovoked, so it's only there by touch, or it happens, you know, all the time without reason, um, and it has been there since initial contact, or once the once a woman may get her period, she can never use tampons. That would be primary um, or secondary. Things were fine for a long time, and then something changed where now this woman has pain somewhere in the vulva. So. Just to go through the, the specific disorders, so infectious, sometimes there can be um, like a yeast infection that can cause vulvar pain, inflammatory, so dermatological conditions like lichen sclerosis, lichen planus, um, neoplastic, so various cancers, neurologic, um, so from a nerve injury, spinal cord injury, or even post herpetic neuralgia, so after you've had a herpes outbreak, the nerve can still be sensitized. Um, trauma like female genital cutting or obstetrical trauma, so with a big tear um, or nerve injury, um, it can be due to uh, treatments for chemo or radiation for cancers or post-operative. And then hormonal deficiencies, so this can be like your postmenopausal women or even um, lactational amenorrhea is just breastfeeding, so when the hormones are really suppressed you can have issues because those tissues need hormones. Um, so those are specific causes of vulvar pain, but they can also be a combination of, um, have associated factors with it. So they can have, like how it says here, that a specific disorder and vulvodynia. So the associated factors, um, most of these are level two evidence, which basically just means that in the literature, there's not enough information to, to say that this can cause vulvodynia, although that there is strong correlations that they coexist together. And that's important because a lot of those coexisting conditions actually do have treatments associated, and we don't really know the cause or effect of it, but we do know that treating the underlying mechanisms can often have an effect um, on improvements in the, the vulvar pain itself. So 
um, just a little bit more about the vocabulary for the descriptors, because this can get a little bit confusing for some. So when we talk about localized or generalized, so we can say that pain at the vestibule is a localized type of vulvodynia. It's located to the vestibule. So we would call that vestibulodynia. There's also those women who have pain at the clitoris. That's part of the vulva, but it's localized just there. So that would be clitoraldynia. Or people can have pain throughout. So in the labias, the clitoris, it may change. Um, and it can also be, uh, well, that one wouldn't necessarily be mixed, but some of these can be mixed. So can then also be provoked versus unprovoked. So provoked would be, it has to be touched in order to have pain. So when you enter, or when you insert a tampon, when you have any sort of penetration, a gynecological exam, when you touch the tissue, there's pain that's provoked. Unprovoked would be, you could just be sitting and have pain for no reason, or you could wake up with pain. Um, and this could be, this can change too. Then there's primary versus secondary. So this is really important to understand also treatment methods. So primary would be ever since the woman remembers, you know, the first time she gets her period and tries to put in a tampon, she can't. The first time she gets a gynecological exam, she can't or it's painful. Um, first time she tries to have intercourse, it's always since she can remember instead of being secondary. So for some time, you know, the woman was having pain-free sex, she was able to use tampons, the gynecological exams were no problem, and then something changed and she then developed pain. Um, and there can also be a temporal pattern. So it can be a constant or persistent. The pain can be intermittent, um, and it can also be either immediate or delayed. So you may have a mix of these characteristics. So, some facts. So about 16% of women in the U.S. have vulvodynia, and it can affect up to 25% of women in their lifetime, which is pretty high. So one in four women may have vulvodynia um, at some point in their life, and it does not discriminate. So it affects women of all ages, ethnicity, and race. Um, its highest incidence is in women from 18 to 25, so pretty young. 60% of women with vulvodynia consult three or more doctors be re before receiving a diagnosis, which is really terrible because then you start to think things are just in your head and you're going crazy and nothing's wrong with you. Um, and you, you know, some women choose to accept that and others actually advocate and try to find somebody else and try to find help or they consult with the internet. So it's really unfortunate that that's such a high number. 40% of women will not receive an accurate diagnosis. And the most common type of pro is provoked vestibulodynia. Um, so 90% of women diagnosed with pro provoked vestibulodynia have pelvic floor dysfunction. So that would be one of those associated factors. We don't know if that's, you know, they have pelvic floor dysfunction, which caused that, or because they had pelvic floor dysfunction, um, they, they got diagnosed with, or they have vestibulodynia, vice versa. So. Digging a little bit deeper into vestibulodynia because it is the most prevalent. So it is a type of vulvodynia. So it's, lo it's a localized vul vulvodynia. So it's localized to the vestibule. Um, it can be primary or secondary. So primary can be what we call neuroproliferative. So that would be like a congenital neuroproliferative, meaning they were sort of born that way. Their tissue, um, is has a higher nerve endings and it's more sensitive from the from birth basically and so those would be the women that you know probably the first time they would notice something is if they start their period and they use a tampon they may remember back that maybe when they took a bath soap burned their vulva but they didn't really make those connections until they started really you know having to deal with some pelvic pelvic issues as you go through puberty. Um, and then, so neuroproliferative can also be a secondary vulvodynia though. Um, a lot of times after repeated infection, so constant yeast infections, that can also uh, cause trauma to the tissue and have the nerves become more sensitive or other trauma. And so that can create what's called a neuroproliferative. So that can be primary or secondary. 
And then there are hormone associations. So there is a genetic predisposition for some women, but we do not know how to identify those women. So more, some women are more sensitive to this than others. Um, and probably the most common uh, association with that is the use of oral contraceptives. Many, 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 many women are on oral or systemic contraceptives. So that can include also your Nuva ring or the implant, the depot shot. So it doesn't have to be a pill. Um, and that is a common cause of, of the vestibulodynia that we see in women. Um, again, some women have more, are more prone to this than others, and we don't really know, have a good way of telling who that woman may be. And it can also be a delayed onset. So they may have been on oral contraceptives for many years and then not, and then again, something happens and now they have pain. But because that's in their history, it's important to take into account. Um, this also goes with some of the medications that are used to treat acne, like spironolactone or Accutane can have a similar effect as oral contraceptives. And then breastfeeding, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, the lactational amenorrhea, because hormones are suppressed during that time of your life, some women do have um, the same type of burning and stinging pain in the vestibule during that time, and it usually resolves post, um, but they also can get treated for that during. And then postmenopausal. So this is the time where our bodies as women go through hormonal changes and we just have suppression in general. And so again, some women have more of a severe reaction and some women go through and they're okay. But this is a concern and it can create more issues in the postmenopausal women. Um, and so I just also wanted to put here that vestibulodynia accounts for approximately 50% of women presenting with dyspareunia, which is painful intercourse, at general gynecological offices. That's a lot of women. And again, if the general provider is not um, aware of what this is, they often will get dismissed. 60% of women. Um, the stat was that, that they have um, an inaccurate diagnosis. So how can you be diagnosed? So official diagnosis will be made um, by a vulvar specialist. So a, a medical doctor can, um, is really the person who's gonna make that official diagnosis. But physical therapists can aid by taking a good history and looking at the vulvar tissues, which I'll show you in a minute what we do and doing a pelvic muscle exam to help rule out any factors and put together a story for the, for the patient and then um, help them find a provider that can help them. So I put this here. This is a great um, source to find a provider near you that, it, that is well-versed in vulvar care. So this is the Ishwish um, website. So, um, you know, I just want to say here, you know, I've seen a lot of women who have seen many gynecologists and they end up because they've done their own research um, at our office and they're telling me their story. And, you know, I asked them about their history of oral contraceptives used. I asked them why they started that. You know, if they started in, as a teenager, they may have started it to control acne or painful periods, not for contraception. Um, and then, you know, if they say for acne, they may have also tried Accutane or spironolactone. So now we have this case developing that wow, this is in your history. You're presenting with this, this, and this. Let's see what we see in the tissue. And that may help at least to identify objective findings. I can't diagnose them with that, but I can put together a story for them that and help them find a specialist who deals with this and actually can get a true diagnosis and appropriate treatment. So I liked this picture here because it shows you what, <laughs> what we do. So this is an actual tissue picture, and I like because it overlies the muscles here, if you can kind of see. So this is, would be part of what we do in our external visual exam. So to orient yourself, so this is a pubic bone. So the mons pubis is up here where you see the um, pubic hair. This is the inner thigh on the patient's right side, left side. So here's the clitoral hood. The clitoris is underneath that. You see the inner labia be, are being pulled over to the side, the outer labia, and then you start to see um, the vestibule, and here's the entroitus right here, and the urethral meatus right here. 
Um, and actually, I mean, this tissue may have some redness. I'll show some pictures in a little bit that show actually what some severe cases look like. But what we're looking for is symmetry of the tissues. What you can't see here is the inner labia. We look to see, do the inner labia connect all the way from the clitoral hood all the way down? Is one side shorter than the other? Now I, I put this in because I think it's interesting and a lot of my patients find it fascinating when I show them with a mirror because you don't really look at your vulva and no one really teaches you what it's supposed to look like. And so when somebody points things out, you have no idea what it looked like previous, nor do you often look at other vulvas to understand what's normal, what's not normal. There's also a lot of variations in vulvas. So I liked this picture because then you can actually see what it looks like. And then you can see the overlying muscles here. So the muscle attachments, it doesn't have to just be a hormonal issue. You can have too tight of muscles. So 90% of women had pelvic floor dysfunction who had provoked vestibulodynia. We don't know if that's what caused it or, or an effect of it. We just know it's there. So these muscles often can be really tight. And actually there's some tissue changes that we can look for um, when we look for this for changes in the skin coloring, which would be like really pale or really bright pink, which I'll show you. Um, sometimes if it's just in the what we call the posterior side, we can identify muscle trigger points when we do our palpation or feeling that can actually refer pain. And maybe they don't have a history of hormonal use or any of that. So we may be more confident that treating the muscular component may actually cause changes in a positive way for this woman. So here's some more pictures um, of what would be essentially vestibulodynia. So starting over here, here you can see there's some atrophy in the inner labia here. They don't go all the way down. Um, they are pretty symmetrical though. And then you can see a lot of white in this tissue. And then right in here, the inner part of the vestibule, this would be like around where the urethra is. There's a lot of redness happening here. The other thing about this vulva in particular is you can't really see where the introitus or the opening to the vagina is, but you see a lot of the urethra. So it's sort of telescoping. That's also a pretty classic sign of what's called vulva vulvovaginal atrophy, and we see that a lot in postmenopausal women. So it is um, some hormonal changes that are occurring. In this picture, you see some redness um, kind of throughout, um, all the way up. Here's a little bit better view of an introitus, so there's not as much of that telescoping of the urethra, so not as much atrophy. And here's um, somebody that just has maybe some redness in the lower part, or what we call the posterior part. Um, her urethral meatus is way up here. You can see a nice opening in the introitus. So this is probably um, somebody that might be, that is premenopausal because they don't have as much of the atrophy. In this picture, you can see a comparison. So this was before treatment. So there's redness all throughout um, the vestibule. And then after a time of hormonal treatment, this is actually what the vulvar will change and look like again. So how do you treat it? Because we know now there is treatments. So there's a lot of different causes of vulvodynia. So that's why a, a really good evaluation and identification of, of each of the factors involved are really key. You know, there can be somebody who had trauma that might necess not necessarily benefit from hormonal treatment as somebody that might have, you know, they, their pain started after they were on birth control for two years. They're going to be very different treatment paths. Um, so that's going to be really important. Um, and then especially getting a pelvic floor exam because, as I mentioned earlier, about 90% of women with provoked vestibulodynia have pelvic floor dysfunction as well. And so identifying all the components that are causing pain and treating them are really important. Um, so that's going to be individualized and specific depending on each individual case. Um, but what we do know is that it takes a team. So it might take a pelvic floor PT, um, a urologist or gynecologist, a potentially a pelvic um, or a pain psychologist or a sex therapist if they've gone through a lot of trauma because of maybe being misdiagnosed or the pain involved and in how it's affected their life um, in maybe in a more intimate way, their relationships, um, pain doctor. And then 
there, there is an algorithm that gives some guidelines for, for healthcare providers that I do want to show. So here is this little nice algorithm. And I mean, there's people that kind of fall out of this, but in general, it's a pretty good thought process to follow. So they're going to have a physical exam. So by a doctor, by a PT, what we do is a cotton swab test. And so this can also be for vulvar, like vulvodynia that's not just directed at the vestibule, but you can, um, in the vestibule, you go in a clockwise direction with a Q-tip and you, you identify points that are painful. So if there's no tenderness, um, you know, and no area of the vulva being touched is described as burning or painful, then maybe they need a different diagnosis. Maybe there's something going on neurologically that's referring. Um, maybe it is just pelvic floor muscles. Um, but if they do have tenderness um, described as an area of touch or burning, depending on the doctor, they may want to get a yeast culture. Um, if it's positive, you go through antifungal. Um, it might have been a yeast infection. If it's negative um, and you know, we need to consider these treatment options. Additionally, depending on where in the vestibule it is, can indicate more of a muscular dysfunction versus hormonal. So that's important too. And, and those specialists can help identify that. Um, and the treatment options here, which we'll go into a little bit more in depth, are vulvar care standards. So your basics, washing, cleaning. Um, there's different topical medications, oral meds, injections, PT, dietary, um, and then some different types of counseling. And at the end, there's, there is a surgery um, that, is, that can be helpful depending on your case and what has and has not worked in the past. But clearly there's other things that are, um, should be tried first. So this just kind of looks at all the team that could be involved. So your MDs, which could be gynecology, urogyne, urology, your primary care doctor, pain management over here, um, PT, psychology, and even nutritional counseling. So I mentioned that we just started our nutritional program at PHRC this last month. And there have been some diets that, um, again, depending on the type of person, can be beneficial um, in conjunction with other treatments. So here, getting more into the treatments for, vul vul for vulvodynia, so healthy vulvar care. So start with your basics. Don't wash with soap. So when you wash in the shower, you can wash around your vulva. So you can wash around like the anus and the mons pubis. You wanna use gentle soaps, especially if you have any skin sensitivities, but you actually don't need to wipe inside or wash inside with soap. Those soaps are actually quite harsh and they can irritate and damage some of that tissue because it's a delicate tissue. It's not the same as our skin. Um, also just taking note of um, using lubrications if there's some dryness to, to, not, um, to, to not have so much friction if you're having intercourse. Um, there are different moisturizers that you can use for more long-term that are safe to use um, on the vulva. There are topical medications. So there's um, different types of pain medications. There's, there's lidocaines that people can apply. Not, not so much as a treatment, but it can help um, you know, live your life while you're getting the while you're actually treating the root causes. They can also prescribe compounded creams that have nerve medications like gabapentin if somebody's so sensitive. So there's a variety of things that are out there um, that, that have been helpful. There's also oral medications. There's different varieties of what's called neuromodulators or different antidepressants. Um, and not because you're depressed or because your vagina is depressed, but because there's off-label uses for these medications for nerve involvement. And then physical therapy with the pelvic floor PT, um, every woman that has pain in the vulva should, should be seen at least or evaluated by a pelvic floor PT. Again, those, that level two evidence shows that there is a high correlation of pelvic floor dysfunction. We don't know if it was there before the pain or because of the pain. We just don't know. Um, so getting that treated as part of your plan is definitely important. And then some may benefit from psychological counseling. You know, there can be a woman who has pain. She goes to her doctor and it happens to be somebody who understands, sends them on their way to PT and they get the right medications, the right treatment, and boom, she's good to go. 
there's other women who have sought treatment for years and years and years. And over time, it has been stressful. There is a lot of pain involved. It's disrupted relationships. There, she's very worried about being intimate with a partner to date again. So I highly recommend um, seeking care from somebody in that field. Um, there are sex therapists. There are there are therapists that deal specifically with chronic pain that have a little bit more knowledge than maybe your general um, than your general psychologist. Um, there's also injections. I mentioned neuromodulators um, with the medications, and then again, there's surgery, which would be a last result, and it depended on the cause of the vestibular denier vulvodynia. So this is just highlighting, this is the most conservative, this is sort of the next line of care, and then this would be the most um, aggressive. So how does a PT help with this? I often get that question, what can we do to help this if it's a tissue issue? Well, we are often the ones who identify the issue and send to the resources that we know. It's a lot easier when you go to a specialist to know where to go than to try to find somebody on, on your own and you may you know, have another failed attempt. Um, so we can help actually with taking a good history, looking at your tissues and referring you to somebody um, that can actually help you get a good diagnosis. We also can provide education. We study this and we help people all the time with this. So um, we spend, you know, in our clinic, we spend an hour with each patient every time. So we can talk through a lot of this. It's a lot of information, especially if you've been, you know, four or five years, no one's told you, you've been to tons of doctors and all of a sudden this is, opens this whole new realm. We can really help to educate about the disease, about the treatment um, and get you, get you the right resources. Um, and then we we do physically help treat the musculoskeletal impairments if those exist too. Um, and we, we help you treat them and then we also give you tools where you can help yourself. So addressing the hypertonic or too tight muscles, the connective tissue restrictions that may be around the pelvis, which would be like some of the myofascial issues, um, if there's nerve tension, pulling and tugging and causing, you know, referred pain somewhere. And then also al alignment issues in the pelvis, um, so biomechanical issues. We can talk to you about your posture and your body mechanics and how that might be contributing to the tight muscles in your pelvic floor. We can help you to improve your motor control. Um, so being able to learn how to relax those muscles can be really hard for some people um, and how to use your core properly to not overuse your pelvic floor. And then providing you with an individualized home program. What can you do on your own? What are the best stretches? What are the best breathing techniques? How do you do that? And then of course, referrals to other members um, and other specialists. So here are some good exercises that really anyone can do, can't really do harm, and it's really good at reducing the tone in the pelvic floor. So first being what's called pelvic floor drops or reverse kegels. So these patients are considered more of what's called high tone pelvic floor. Low tone would be your incontinence, your prolapse a lot of the time. Those are the two lax. These people have too tight of pelvic floor muscles often. So we wanna relax them or let them go. Um, diaphragmatic breathing, which is really important because the diaphragm and the pelvic floor, they have this nice rhythm where they contract and relax together. So learning how to breathe, which may also help some of your anxiety you're having around this, can actually relax your pelvic floor and make the pain less. Um, heat or sits baths, you don't wanna do this if you have an active infection. And also um, some, some people do prefer ice. Um, I would say do not ice directly on the tissue or longer than 15 minutes. Um, child's pose and foam rolling. So child's pose, as you can see here, anything that really gets your knees above the hips and kind of opens the pelvis in that way, a supported deep squat, happy baby, um, laying with your legs elevated are all good positions. Um, and then foam rolling all the tissues around the pelvis. So your inner thighs, your glutes, your, your IT band, your quads, that's really good as well. And we do have a lot of videos on our YouTube channel. So you can go to youtube.com slash pelvic pain rehab and you can find a lot of videos that Courtney has put up there. Um, a lot of foam rolling uh, exercises and then pelvic floor drops, reverse kegels, diaphragmatic breathing um, that you can do on your own. 
What else? So we talked about good vulva, vulvar care. So in general, if you're having pain or if you're in a flare, cotton underwear is very breathable and then avoiding tight clothing. A lot of like yoga pants might have an inseam that can irritate, especially if you have like a clitoral dynia, that cannot be too comfortable, especially working out where you're having constant friction and rubbing. Um, eliminate soaps directly on the vulva. So again, these are very harsh products. They need to get the germs off your hands. You don't really want that on the vulva. The vulva is under normal conditions, self-cleaning. Um, so obviously if there's an infection, you wanna treat the infection, but otherwise, if you clean around um, and you can just have water wash, that's, that is enough. Um, do not douche, so water only in the vulva. And then looking also at different um, chemicals. So, you know, if you're, if you're washing your clothes in laundry detergent that has a lot of chemicals and you already know that your skin might be sensitive in general, getting something for sensitive skin or not with the harsh chemicals can be helpful using lubricants. So slippery stuff, Uber Lube um, is great. So water-based lubricants and use a lot of it when you have sex. A lot of times the tissue can be dry and irritated at the same time. And so that's gonna be really helpful in not creating unwanted friction. And then the old saying of go pee after you have sex. So it says urinate and wash before and after sex. Um, just making sure that you flush that area and you're not having somebody else's germs on you um, afterwards. That's just good practice. And then staying hydrated is always important. So about half your body weight in ounces of water per day. Um, and I had mentioned some dietary factors involved with vulvodynia. So there have been some evidence for low oxalate diets to help with vulvodynia. This can be in very particular types of people. It's not something that can be effective for everyone have it, that has vulvodynia. But it's definitely something to try, especially if you've had multiple treatments and different things haven't worked. Um, and then anti-inflammatory diets are great to also incorporate as part of the treatment. This is, a, this is something that is sort of rooted in inflammation. And so cutting out the sugar and the dairy and the gluten um, might actually help you heal faster. It may not be directly related to that, but it can help the overall process of healing faster. Um, but again, this should be something that is individualized. So working with a nutritionist um, is really important. So to kind of summarize, I liked this because this sort of brought vulvodynia um, on the mainstream in Sex and the City, uh, where Charlotte talks about how her vagina is depressed. You know, she never looks at it. And um, I think one of the other ladies, you know, says, well, that's probably why it's depressed. So, and she gets prescribed an antidepressant. Um, so as I mentioned before, there's different medications that are or can be effective in treatment. And one of them is, a, it's called a tricyclic antidepressant. And does, it doesn't even have to do with depression why this works, it's called an off-label use. So they've shown that there has benefits independent of any sort of mental or mood issue going on. And so that's sort of where that came about, but it's not that you or your vagina is depressed. It's just a medication that has shown improvement. Um, but some key points with this is, you know, a lot of women are dismissed by their doctors. And so that's unfortunate. And hopefully with the change of the nomenclature, this is becoming more evident among general providers. Um, but also know that don't take no for an answer, it is your body. And if something's wrong, finding the right provider is, is definitely gonna be key. Um, again, many women are also then giving inappropriate medications because they do not have a thorough assessment. As I went over, there's a lot of different reasons and causes for vulvodynia. And so making sure that your assessment is very thorough and correct, it is going to be very important to get the right treatment. Um, PTs can help with guidance to appropriate healthcare members, and we can also help improve the state of the tissues, optimizing the blood flow and the function. So actually physically working on them, teaching you how to relax them is going to then provide more blood flow to the area, which is going to bring more hormones and bring more healing um, cells to the, to the tissues. So if you're listening and some of this has rang a bell, 
I think some some good quick questions to say is, you know, do you have a history of your using birth control? 90% of women or 90% um, of vulvodynia is provoked vestibulodynia. So there's a high correlation with the use of oral contraceptives. So that could be one thing. Have you used that in the past and do you have vulvar pain? Um, and also then have you just seen a pelvic floor PT? Um, again, as I went over extensively, we can do a lot in both the treatment and the guiding and education piece of this. So seeking out your local pelvic floor PT may help you by getting PT, but it also may help you get directed to the appropriate um, healthcare team. So here are some resources. So the National Vulvodynia Association self-help guide. Um, there's a few books. So When Sex Hurts, A Woman's Guide to Banishing Sexual Pain by Drs. Andrew Goldstein, Caroline Foucault, and Erwin Goldstein. Ending Female Pelvic Pain, A Woman's Manual by Issa Herrera. Heal Pelvic Pain by Amy Stein. The V Book, A Doctor's Guide to Complete Vulvovaginal Health by Elizabeth Gunther, Stewart, and Paula Spencer. And Pelvic Pain Explained by our co-founders Stephanie Prendergast and Elizabeth Rummer. So um, I just wanted to go through a couple of pretty common questions um, and we had asked some people what they wanted to know. So what are some tips for pelvic pain with and after sex while trying to conceive? So this is a really great question because a lot of women are still wanting to get pregnant and you know this is what maybe brings them into pelvic floor PT um, because they're trying to get pregnant, which means they have to have sex um, or have something inserted into them. And that may cause pain and you, it's okay to have sex while you're in treatment, um, you know, depending on your comfort level. So I would say a lot of lube. So getting a good lube that's not going to irritate your tissues. So slippery stuff and Uber Lube are great um, water-based lubricants and use a lot of it. <laughs> uh, this is really just going to help your comfort level. Um, it's going to help everything have less friction. Um, additionally, you're not going to have, you know, a tightening because there was friction, then you tense, and then things can't move smoothly. So it's just really helpful. Um, and KY Jelly and some of the stuff that you can find at the stores, those might not be the best loops because those might be drying. So again, consulting a public health specialist um, can be helpful in guiding you to what type of lube is best. We also have a blog on uh, all about lube on our website, so you can check that out as well. Um, breathing exercises and pelvic floor drops before and after. So some women may be anxious in going into having sex because they know it might be painful, so they further tighten. So doing some good diaphragmatic breathing exercises or pelvic floor relaxation exercises before and then again after can be helpful in maybe minimizing the intensity of the pain that you're going to experience either during or after because the muscles are less tight. Um, and then there are, again, I mentioned vaginal moisturizers earlier. Um, a, the difference between a vaginal, like a lubricant and a moisturizer is that moisturizers tend to stay on the tissue for longer. So Good Clean Love has um, a new product line, I believe, that has some more of moisturizers. Again, you know, talk to the public floor PT you're working with to make sure it isn't, um, it doesn't have a bunch of chemicals in it. So no parabens, no, uh, there's a bunch of list of chemicals that are not good for you. Again, we have a blog that lists all of them, um, but you don't want any of those harsh ones. So you'll see like no parabens, um, that's, that's usually a good sign. Um, so again, Good Clean Love, V Magic, and Vital Vulva are all um, different moisturizers and stuff that you can use on the vulva. So this is a pretty common one I see. Um, my gynecologist did thorough testing for infections and tested my hormones and everything came back normal. All right, well, it's good that all the infections are cleared because then you've ruled that cause out. Um, there can be some kind of hidden ones that not every standard gynecologist will take, especially on the first, first meeting that you see them, um, but usually you can clear the infections. Regarding the hormones, so usually gynecologists will test, your standard gynecologist will test hormones related to fertility. 
So some of the really important hormones that we actually do need to see that can indicate this issue, like a vestibulodynia that's maybe hormonally, um, the, the onset is because of a hormonal issue, um, you actually need these hormones tested. So you need your total testosterone, you need your free testosterone, and in order to get your free, you need what's called sex hormone binding globulin tested, SHBG. It's a protein in your liver that increases, especially with the use of oral contraceptives, uh, spironolactone and Accutane, um, that will then bind your free testosterone. And you may have normal production of testosterone because you're a young, healthy woman, but your body may not be able to use it because of that. And this is not standard hormone testing. So all of the vulva, like the vulvar specialists we work with that understand this, they test it all the time. Your regular OBGYN or nurse practitioner or PCP that's giving you care, they will not standard, they will not test this just standard. Um, so you may have to ask them. And that, depending on what the numbers are, that can indicate that there may be an issue. So if you would like to read more about how some people beat vulvodynia, we have a few blogs on our, on our website. So how Diane beat vulvodynia, love and vaginismus, Mary's story of personal growth, and female pelvic pain explained, Megan's success story. So you can, these are actual patients that we've seen. Their names are obviously changed, um, but it is, it goes through their story, how we treated them, wet assessments, and how their progress was. And most of our success stories, they actually do give us a little blurb that we can use so you can kind of hear from them. So we um, also, in this time of COVID right now, we are now offering digital health services or what you may know as telehealth. So we are doing this for anyone seeking care. So you might be in a state that our offices are not in and you can make an appointment with us with, on our website. Um, we're offering 30 minute appointments at this time. We are also offering the integrative health and nutrition services. Um, and Steph and Liz are also offering online mentoring. So if you're a provider out there and want to learn more, you can sign up if you go to our website, www.pelvicpainrehab.com. And I just want to say thank you to everyone. And hopefully that was informational and you learned something about vulvodynia, whether it's about yourself, a friend, a family member, or your patient to better help them. So um, you can follow us. Uh, our blog is pelvicpainrehab.com slash blog. And we do release new blogs every Thursday, all about pelvic health. We are on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Um, and thank you again.